Good morning. Welcome to worship. Let's sing together. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. 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 Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Satan had me bound. Jesus lifted me. Satan had me bound. Jesus lifted me. Satan had me bound. Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. When I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me. When I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me. When I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Will you join me in prayer? Help us, O oh God, in this time of worship to know your ways, to understand your teachings, and to hear your word. Allow us the blessing of angels to wait upon us and grant us the confidence which shines through the rainbow that your promises are everlasting. In your son's name, amen. Reverend Dr. William Barber is a well-known activist with the Poor People's Campaign. He gave the sermon for President Biden's inaugural prayer service, and he is a Disciples of Christ minister. The following prayer is a portion of his prayer uh, from 2017. So please join me for a few moments of silent meditation, personal reflection, followed by our prayer. Will you pray with me? Gracious, eternal, and all-wise God, Thou who formed what is out of nothing and called us into being to serve You, You, O Lord, who weigh every nation in the balance of Your own standards. Today we acknowledge how great Thou art, the marvelous mystery of Your mercy and the excellence of Your name, because Your Holy Spirit brings all things to remembrance. Breathe on us now that we might remember how gracious you have been to this nation we call America. We pray all of these things in the name of the one who taught his first disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In a time where so many are without basic necessities all over the country, it is important that we pool our resources together and help one another. Your offering at Forest Park does just that. A portion of your offering goes to help those that do not have the necessary resources to live. 
Our resources, our Forest Park resources, are combined with regional and denominational resources that will impact the greater number of people. So in a time when lots of children are crying out uh, to God, our offering states, here I am, send me. You can give uh, in several different ways here at Forest Park. Tithely is our online giving options located on our website under our offerings tab. Also, you can send something by the mail uh, or you can drop something off at the church. But loving God and loving neighbor works when we all pool our resources. We will now accept this morning's offering. This month we've been singing spirituals from our hymnal as part of Black History Month. And as we are in the season of Lent, this hymn really speaks to that, this spiritual Jesus walked this lonesome valley. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. He had to This is the very first Sunday of Lent. Lent is a specified limited time where we engage in introspection while we journey with Jesus all the way to the cross and then eventually resurrection. But it's a, it's a really important time in the Christian calendar. You know what else is a limited time? Nacho fries from Taco Bell. I love the nacho fries and the cheese dip because we have to get them now because they're going to go away. That's what Lent is. Lent is a time, a specified time, where we work on our relationship with God and our faith walk so that Easter is that much more um, sweet. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, for this is my body. After the meal, he lifted up the cup said, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this also in remembrance of me. I welcome everyone, everyone to this table. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong through it all through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God through it all 
So our text today is part of a story that we have all heard. But as is the case with many biblical stories, what's actually written down, what's actually in our Bible is a little different than what's in the children's Bible and in our Sunday school lessons as a youth. Today we encounter Noah and the flood. The story spans three chapters in Genesis, and it's one of the poorest edited stories in our Bible. There are clearly two distinctive voices, two distinctive authors in this text, and some ancient editor just jumbled them all up. And so I'm very angry with this ancient editor, but that's cool. All that being said, this text I'm fixing to read is just after the flood, after the ark, after all the death and devastation, and this is God uh, talking here. So Genesis 9... Uh, 8 through 16. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. May God add a blessing to the reading of the Holy Scriptures. You join me in prayer. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. It is good to be here in whatever way you are connecting with us for this worship experience. You know, there are some fantastic stories in our Bible. And the flood has captured the imaginations of so many artists and storytellers and, and movies. And uh, I, was, I was trying to find some example, some real world example for us, to, uh, for us to talk about in this sermon. But how do I do that for a flood, especially one that's been done over and over and over again? I started praying for modern day examples of something that I can use. What would make this more relatable and really bring it into our context here. I found such an example. I prayed an example manifested itself. The Lord works in mysterious ways. It was Tuesday morning, this past Tuesday. And of course, there was no reason for me to be at church. Snow was everywhere. Uh, there was more snow coming that day. I had already uh, done everything I needed. I got everything home that I needed to have home, but I thought, you know, I need to go feed the fish anyway, so let's go up to church. So I go up to church, um, and again, I started to, I walked in the, the church, and I heard a noise. I heard a noise coming from the education wing. So I started to walk up the ramp, and the noise started to grow. And as I turned the corner to face the long hallway of the education wing, this is what I found. That's right, friends. We had a pipe burst in our education wing, and the education wing was ripe for an ark and a double set of each animal. We actually caught it before it could get really, really bad. We caught it before it could get into the sanctuary or anything like that, but we're going to be repairing floors and maybe doing a little repainting uh, over the next few weeks here. No animals or people were harmed in the rendition of this flood. But be on the lookout for an update from our board chair as to how we are proceeding and what help we might uh, need. 
Again, it could have been a whole lot worse. But clearly, your pastor needs to be a little more specific when he prays for examples for his flood sermon. Let's get back to the Genesis flood, shall we? Do you know how many flood stories there were in the ancient world? So many flood stories. It was a very common theme in the ancient world to tell flood stories. And there were even stories of people building boats to survive these floods. And in these stories, the flood waters were normally sent by some god or a group of gods or something to destroy humans because humans have made a mess of this planet Earth. The gods were angry, and so the flood waters were a way for them to just hit reset and we start all over again. So the story in Genesis 7, that starts in Genesis 7, is another tale of divine judgment using water to wipe out the humans. But this story, this story does something strange. It does something that the other ancient stories did not do. Um, Unlike all the other stories where everyone dies and the gods are appeased somehow, this story presents God as, uh, as one that does not act like the other gods. Now, the story starts off the same, let's be honest. God was sorry that God had made humans. That's in the text also. For every inclination of their heart was evil. That's also in the text. That's why God sent the floodwaters. God was going to wipe out everyone and start over using destructive forces and violence, such as drowning and whatnot. People and animals were drowned while the whole world was swallowed up with divine judgment. But there was one family that was protected. And the one family was Noah's family. And in chapter 8, God says the following, I will never again curse the ground because of humans, nor will I destroy every living, every living creature as I have done, because the human heart is still evil. That's what God is saying here. Then we have our reading that I read from chapter 9, where God puts a rainbow in the sky to remind God of the covenant. That is a huge, huge development. God is repenting from what God has done. Now that's not the way we learned it in Sunday school. We get really uncomfortable when we talk about the Almighty repenting from something. We talk about God repenting or changing directions. That makes people feel uncomfortable. But that's exactly the way it is presented in our good holy book. God was sorry that God had made people. So God's flood comes and God discovers that it did not work. The human heart is still evil, God says. Therefore, God changes direction. God says, sorry about that. I'm not going to do that again. It didn't work. Then God puts a rainbow in the sky. Why does God put this rainbow in the sky? As a kid, I was told that God put a rainbow in the sky to remind us of God's covenant to not destroy the world again by flood. But that's not supported in this story. When I, this is God talking, when I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, then I will remember my covenant. The rainbow's not for us. The rainbow is a reminder for the Almighty to not do this again. God's plan did not work. And instead of doubling down or laying blame elsewhere or passing the buck, God owned it. God said, yep, that didn't work. I'm not going to do that again. God owned it. God realized the path that God was going on was not working. God changed direction and then put a constant reminder in front of God to not do it again. That is how one does repentance. This is the first Sunday of Lent, and repentance is a big part of our Lenten observance. We don't talk much about repentance in the Disciples of Christ tradition, and because of that, there, may have been, there might be some misconceptions surrounding uh, the concept of repentance. People tend to use it as a synonym for an apology or something, like, I repent of taking the last cookie, or whatever nonsense, right? That's not what repentance is at all. 
Repentance is turning from a certain path. You are going down and changing directions. Jesus said uh, very, very soon after he was baptized, after he came back from the wilderness, he said, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. What Jesus means is turn from the path you are currently going down because the kingdom has a different path. We are inviting you onto that path. And again, it has very little, if anything, to do with an apology. It has everything to do with doing an about face and heading in a new direction. And I would remind us all, and me included, that so much of scripture is communal. We've individualized this religion, but so much of scripture is communal. The admonishment to repent was stated to a group, not to individuals. And while there are many things that you can and should repent from as an individual, what do we need to repent from as a group of people? A group of people that are faith-bound. We have been learning this month about black history through prayers and songs we have done in worship here, but there are other things we can learn as well. Just like the average black worker earns just 62% of what their white counterpart makes. The poverty rate in, for families of color is two and a half times what it is for white families. While 40% of white students earn credit in AP classes, that number goes down to 20% for our African American brothers and sisters. Denial rates for home loans are substantially higher among black applicants than their white counterparts. Black Americans are twice as likely to lack health insurance than their white neighbors. And black inmates make up a third of our prison population while only making up 12% of the country's population. Black men are five times more likely to be incarcerated than their white counterpart. I could spend hours listing stats just like that, but the point is the same. We need to repent from racism. I am preaching right now to no one. There's no one here in this, in this audience, except for James. James is here. But I can hear the groans from your living room. I can hear the complaints rising up right now. But Pastor Bill, I didn't cause any of this. Pastor Bill, I don't see color. I don't know why anybody would see color. Pastor Bill, I treat everyone the same, no matter what their color is. Fantastic. I don't care about any of that it doesn't matter if you were complicit in setting up racism in this country that was started 400 years ago when they started capturing people in Africa and selling them in the new world all the while removing native people from this world at the point of a sword and much much worse you don't have to be complicit in the acts of racism, to repent from the path we are all on. Repentance is doing an about face because the direction we are on is not good. Just like God showed us in Genesis. God could have kept flooding the earth over and over and over again until God uh, realized that this path was wrong, but God realized it early and said, I'm not doing this again. And it was so important for God to repent that God put a reminder for God in the sky every single time it rains. It's not enough that we mind our own business and stay in our lane and claim that everyone is equal. The Jesus movement is a movement to build a just society. To be an active participant. To bring about healing and wholeness for everyone. Racism flies in the face of all of it. Racism is as evil a thing as the world has ever seen. Atrocity after atrocity is done in the name of racism. Because when groups of people are dehumanized in the eyes of others, then evil, the, the evil that ensues is unchecked and rampant. It is so overwhelming, though to think about the massive systemic problem of racism and repenting from sins that are societal, not just individual. 
But would you like a place to start? I know it's so overwhelming. Do you want a place to start working on the repentance from societal sins? It's with listening. It's with relationship building. It's in the recognition that your set of circumstances in your life is not the set of circumstances for everyone on this, in this country or on this globe. Stats, statistics like I just shared, those are easily dismissed. I mean, you can find other statistics that counteract that in this culture where no one can trust any of the news sources at all. Therefore, start learning yourself. Start engaging with people of color and metaphorically open your eyes to the realities we miss in our bubble. Because for far too long, we have dismissed narratives that do not line up with our own. Dismissing the stories, the experiences, and the pain from our brothers and sisters of color is something we need to repent from. Pretending everything is okay just because we are insulated is something we need to repent from. Claiming Jesus as Lord while entire cultures are being marginalized by others who also claim Jesus as Lord is something we need to repent from. You don't have to be responsible for the creation or even the implementation of racism. But if we don't move off of this current path, then we are neither loving neighbor nor God. And I'm pretty sure that was the only two things we were asked to do. So I leave you with this. Words from Jesus right after he got out from the desert, starting his public ministry, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Thanks be to that God. Amen. Friends, Lent is a time for hard conversations. It's a time for spiritual exploration. Sometimes that's not fun to do, but with a community of faith, we can get through this together with grace and mercy and the God of love with us. Nothing is impossible. Now, if you'd like a church family where we are trying to do these hard conversations together, well, then reach out to me. My email address is revbillhim at gmail.com. I would love to talk to you about belonging to this community of faith known as Forest Park. It's a wonderful worshiping community. If you've never made that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, today is your day. Call me or email me, and I would love, love to be in conversation with you about what that means. Now for the rest of us, Take this time as a time of renewal. It's not all about, right, you know, it's not all about the sunshine. We have hard conversations too, but we do it within a community of faith where we can all support one another. So please join me in prayer. Holy and gracious God, as we journey this journey with Jesus toward the cross, we need your help. We need your grace and we need your mercy. Show us the way. In your son's name we pray, amen. Go in peace and God bless.